Bonjour. Anin, hello, Tonsei. Juni wichu aganak nibin ma kwan dijna kaz ma kwan to tem minagosi bi andongi. I just introduced myself and my uh, traditional name, Nibin Makwa, is the name given to me by the ancestors through special ceremony. Nibin Makwa in my language means summer bear. And I said, Makwa Tontem, uh, I'm a bear clan, which takes my uh, affiliations beyond the family boundaries and across the, uh, across the turtles back to many different indigenous nations who are also uh, recognized the clan system. I'm from the Pine Creek. Anishinaabe people, Minagosibi Anishinaabe, are currently confined and contained within the reserve boundaries called the Pine Creek First Nation, where the waters flow from the Duck Mountains and the Riding Mountains into the uh, south, or the, I, I would say the west, the west side of Lake Winnipeg Ozis. The, uh, the Nipanak family is one of the many families that uh, resides on the uh, Pine Creek First Nation. Uh, we have our roots. Uh, many families within the region have their roots that go back to um, Treaty 4 and parts of Saskatchewan, as well as Treaty 2, which is most of uh, western Manitoba, west central Manitoba, and into the Inner Lake. That's where I come from, from the Nipanak family. On my father's side, I'm from the Roulette family, from the Sandy Bay First Nation in Treaty 1, which is a little further south, but also in western Manitoba. I want to uh, acknowledge and make a special recognition that we are on the ancestral lands of the Algonquin people. It's an honor that you open your community up and these lands to host uh, such an important event. It's uh, great to see members from the indigenous community, Canadians, Quebecers and others convening here together on a scale that we haven't really seen to collaborate and talk about common issues. <clears throat> I think together we can bring a positive influence towards reshaping and building the, can the Canada that we can be proud of. A Canada that I can say is inclusive and safe of my children and my future grandchildren as well as yours. And I'm honored as well to say that I'm here with my son today, sitting right there, Kiwetan Nipanak is his name. And he was uh, named by the Medewan elder, uh, Toba Sanakwat. His name is uh, Manatu Wachu. Spirit Mountain is his name. And I'm very honored that he's here even though he won't listen to me very well on his, while he's playing his games on his iPod. <laughs> I also want to thank the organizers of the People's Social Forum, who spent several months planning and preparing for these days. I want to thank Chantelle Dubois, who has helped prepare me for today, as well as Anna Nicole Collins, who observed the protocols of my people, the Anishinaabeg people, and passed me tobacco to be here today with you. Uh, Anna approached me at the Tar Sands Healing Walk uh, near Fort McMurray, Alberta, passed me tobacco and invited me to be here. So it's a great honor for me to receive tobacco and to be asked to speak here because that is the formal protocol for uh, invoking my messages uh, as well as messages of other Anishinaabe leaders is that we don't uh, go around talking, uh, just shooting from the hip on a lot of these things. Uh, the, the protocols are observed and that's what puts us into action. So. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm happy to have received the tobacco and to be here today. With the time that I've been given, I'd like to touch upon three primor primary areas that are uh, not only regionally significant for Manitoba's First Nations people, but nationally significant to the interests of all Canadians from both economic and social perspectives. Uh, currently, my role is as the Grand Chief of the Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs, and um, if you're not familiar with what a political territorial organization is, the AMC is made up of 61 communities that uh, have a membership of the chiefs. So the chiefs convene on a, on a regular basis. We talk about key areas, priority areas that, uh, of common interest, common concern. We create resolutions and mandates from those resolutions. With uh, Primarily resourced from the federal government as well as from other levels of government. The organization has been around for 25 years and it's through the membership of the 61 chiefs that we have an impact on upwards of 150,000 First Nations people within the province of Manitoba. The organization, the uh, Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs, in its, uh, in its existence has created other organizations and service delivery organizations to the point where 
every single person in Manitoba who's of uh, First Nations ancestry will someday access a service or a program or re receive something that the Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs has created over its, over its lifetime. Uh, I believe I am the, uh, the fifth Grand Chief of the organization and uh, I'm honoured to have been uh, re-elected at the end of July of this month to, to take on another term. The organization itself has gone through somewhat of a transformation in the last three years where in, in the past a lot of these political organizations have been looked at as agents for federal or provincial governments, policy and law. Um, we're now shifting away from that to create more of a rights-based advocacy uh, approach. We're also taking much more of a rights-based protection approach to how we uh, move forward both within the region of Manitoba but also on the broader scale when it comes to national political issues. So you will see the Manitoba leadership take a very strong position oftentimes with respect to the direction or the asserted direction that federal governments would, would try to impose uh, on our people. We believe that a rights-based approach towards uh, advocacy in our region involves recognition of self-determination, recognition of self-government, but also the recognition that there is a resource base that remains intact that must accrue to the benefit of both uh, the indigenous people of, uh, of the territory uh, on their ancestral lands, but also all of those who come and settle amongst the, uh, the, uh, uh, the indigenous nations in Manitoba, which is very, very inclusive. We have a, a city, we have a province that is very, very diversified in, in where people come from, from around the globe. And that's in keeping with, with the nature of the territory. The territory where the Assiniboine River meets the Red River has been known for thousands of years as a gathering place where trade and commerce has taken place from the various nations from around the Turtles Back who have convened there. And it's in that spirit, I believe, that Winnipeg and Manitoba still exist. So we do still welcome people from around the globe, around the world, to come and partake and, and to live as citizens amongst us. And we honour that within the treaty territory. With the time I've been given today, I'd like to touch upon three priority areas, as I said. The first one being murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls and the connection to the child and family services industry. Number two being indigenous education and the renewal of indigenous teaching methods or pedagogies. Number three being resource development and the need to empower alternative energy. I believe that the, all three of these issues are national in scope and I'm here today to talk about them, to bring broader awareness to them and ask for your help, to ask for your help in making these stronger national issues going forward as we look towards uh, the future and maybe look towards a new government. Before I get into specific discussions on these matters, though, I wanted to share with everyone a recollection that we'll likely all share respecting the current Prime Minister and his apology on June 8, 2008. On that day, the Prime Minister stated, for more than a century, Indian residential schools separated over 150,000 Aboriginal children from their families and communities. Two primary objectives of the residential school system were to remove and isolate children from the influences of their homes, families, traditions, and cultures, and to assimilate them into the dominant culture. These objectives were based on the assumption that Aboriginal cultures and spiritual beliefs were inferior and unequal. The Prime Minister continued to state Today, we recognize that this policy of assimilation was wrong, has caused great harm, and has no place in our country. I offer you the Prime Minister's words now at the beginning of the discussion so that you might consider whether the conditions giving rise to the perpetuation, the existence of the residential school system are really part of our past, or are they alive and well and continuing to cause damage to the social fabric of this nation that we call Canada. The first topic that I wanted to talk about is missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. And I have a mandate from the Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs to discuss these matters, a standing mandate on an ongoing basis because these tragedies continue to unfold in the streets uh, of Winnipeg, in the, in the rural community and throughout Canada. Any discussion on the issue of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls must start with an understanding about the meaning of the concept violence against women. 
The United Nations defines violence against women as any act of gender-based violence that results in or is likely to result in physical, sexual, or psychological harm or suffering to women, including threats of such acts, coercion, or arbitrary deprivation of liberty, whether occurring in public or private life. Now, the best information that we have comes from Sisters in Spirit, which is an initiative that is no longer funded by the Harper regime. Their studies revealed to us the tip of the iceberg of the problem of violence against Indigenous women. Their statistical data began to show a social phenomena of the incidence of violence against Indigenous women, which often results in the tragedies, such as what we have recently witnessed in, uh, in Winnipeg, Manitoba. <clears throat> Today, as Sisters in Spirit began to move from gathering evidence into real, tangible uh, actions, the Harper regime stopped funding them. Today, the momentum generated by the Sisters in Spirit initiative through the Native Women's Association of Canada has been lost without the resources to continue the focused effort. <clears throat> I think that's a very significant consideration for us to make because we're not only facing a Prime Minister who refuses to recognize the need for a public inquiry, is driving a government that is denying access to resources to continue a focused effort from those who had previously been working on it. Sisters in Spirit provided us with valuable information that ramped up the focus and attention to the tragedies we're living with. For instance, we know that Manitoba has more murder cases involving First Nations and other Aboriginal women and girls than in other parts of Canada. 81% of the murder cases uh, in Manitoba versus 60% of the national average. Almost half of the unsolved murder cases in Manitoba involve First Nations and other Aboriginal women and girls. This is also higher than the national average. At the time of the study that was done, two main factors had been identified by First Nations and Aboriginal women, families and non-governmental organizations as the reason why so many Indigenous women suffer from extreme violence. One being the failure of police to protect Indigenous women and girls from violence and to investigate promptly and thoroughly when they are missing or murdered. Now, I want you to consider that, that finding in light of the Opal Inquiry, which seems to affirm what this conclusion stated, was that police at the time were not diligent in their efforts. Two, the disadvantaged social and economic conditions in which Indigenous women and girls live, which makes them vulnerable to violence and unable to escape from it. At the time of the studies, the Native Women's Association of Canada speculated that the scope of the violence was far greater than the documented cases they were able to identify, and they were correct. Since this data was compiled by Sisters in Spirit, the RCMP have since reported that there are close to 1,200 missing or murdered Aboriginal women or girls throughout Canada. Now, I can go on and provide a, a more thorough education on this, but Oftentimes, when we talk about this, these concepts in the abstract, we fail to draw in, I believe, the, uh, the real challenge that we all face, you know, as individuals and as families and as communities of Indigenous people. There's real people impacted, and families are suffering across the country from the loss of our loved ones. Now, as all, although I sit here before you today, I'm no exception to the trauma and the grief from the loss of our loved ones to, to the violence that we are experiencing. You know, and I, I'm going to provide a bit of a personal reflection and let you know that, you know, my own story starts in the days of my mother's uh, Indian residential school experience. The Nipanak family moved to Pine Creek First Nation so that, we, so that the parents could be closer to the kids that were, our kids that were going into the Pine Creek residential school. And, you know, my mom was one of those ones that went into the uh, residential school in Pine Creek and she was abused because of her language. <clears throat> she was uh, abused because when she went into that school, she didn't speak any English. She didn't speak any French. She only spoke our language, which is Anishinaabe, Anishinaabe language. And uh, today, I sit here and I tell people, Pangi Anishinaabe win. I only speak a little bit of my language. And I believe that's a result of my mom's experience and the trauma that she experienced while going to these schools in, the, in Pine Creek, as well as in Dauphin. 
By the age of 15, my mom had moved to the city of Winnipeg at the age of 15 to go to school there to continue her, her schooling. At that time, those that were running the residential schools had begun to tell children that they had no future going back to their reserves. There was no value they could create by going back to their communities, back to their families, and that they should begin going to the cities. And that's exactly what happened. In the 1960s and the 1970s, our people began moving from our reserves into the urban centers in big numbers, okay? In our slow migration to urban life, we were treated like refugees in our own ancestral lands. There were no services for our people, no help, no resources were there to help our people, no formal resources, I should say, because each and every one of our family members relied on one another, both within our families and within our neighborhoods when we made these transitions. We lost many people during this time. No statistics out there have been compiled to track how many people we lost in the early days of our urban migration. For instance, in my own family, in 1978, we lost one of my aunts in the streets of Winnipeg. Um, I was already uh, four years old at that time, and I can recall the pain and the hurt of my family as uh, she came home in a, in a, in a box. And uh, we had remaining uh, a lot of questions outstanding as a family. Uh, we didn't know exactly what happened. There was speculation um, of, of, of a violent death, but we didn't know the full details. And uh, there's many, many of my family, some of the older folks in, our, in my family that are still wondering. They're still going through a lot of pain, and I guess we all are in, in many ways. In 2011, we lost another family member, <clears throat> Tanya Nipanak went missing, and when serial killer Sean Lamb was arrested in Winnipeg on June 21st, 2012, it was identified that Tanya's body may have been dumped in the Brady landfill on the south side of the city of Winnipeg. Now, I didn't know Tanya, but I know that her dad was first cousins with my mom, and it was part of that residential school aftermath where a lot of our, a lot of our people began moving in those different directions where we lost those family connections. And although we are very closely related, we live in isolation from one another. And that's one of the problems and one of the outcomes of the residential school experience. These family losses resonate and remain throughout our entire lifetimes. And we know that we don't recover from the loss of our loved ones when, when they leave in this way. We only find ways of coping with that loss. Now, sometimes those coping mechanisms express themselves in unhealthy ways, such as self-hate, addiction, and even the loss of life. Sometimes we find the strength in our cultural ways to continue to live and to do our part to bring healing and change to our families for a better and safer tomorrow. It's not an easy path for any of us, no matter, uh, no matter which route we choose. <clears throat> I think that this is where we have to call into question the role of the federal government. In recent years, we've not only been dealing with Mr. Harper's government refusal to fund and call for a national public inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls, we've also been dealing with his government's refusal to fund organizations that are engaging in the subject and creating greater awareness of this ongoing social tragedy. This is not the kind of leadership that Canadians need in order to create safer streets, safer neighborhoods, and a caring and inclusive society. <clears throat> our families and our communities are not willing to sit back any longer and watch tragedies continue to happen right before our eyes in the streets of the cities across the country. We want action now, and we believe that by engaging the brightest minds in the country on the issue, by way of inquiry, we can achieve two outcomes. One, we can move, as a society, we can move together from a culture of denial to a culture of acceptance that we have a significant social problem that we must overcome together. Two, we can develop the systems and the resources that could be targeted and specific to the needs of vulnerable community members who most often have very minimal resources on their own to succeed. Why can we not move in this direction together? Why do we face a, a prime minister who says this is a policing issue or this is left for police investigations 
as opposed to recognizing that there's a broader social phenomena that's occurring and that's causing great tragedy amongst uh, a definable group of our communities. Why do we allow this to persist? Why does this denial continue to persist in this day and age, in this day of enlightenment? We're better than that as a society, and I think we have to hold this government to account. And if it means that this becomes a national issue, a national issue for, uh, for uh, uh, an election that will likely be called next spring, then let's make it that. Let's make it that together. In light of the recent tragedy with one of our children, the late Tina Fontaine, we're now working towards the recognition that there's an alarmingly significant connection between the child family services system and our missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. I think that a lot of us have been aware of this for quite some time, and a lot of us have seen the interconnectedness from one generation to the next about the occurrence of our children ending up in this system, coming out of this system having no resources and then being lost to the, to the, uh, to the, to the streets or lost to uh, the, uh, the occurrence of, of, uh, of what we've been witnessing. I myself had engaged in Manitoba regional engagement sessions we had one in the north and we had one in the southern parts of the province of Manitoba where we invited people who have had occurrences with the child welfare system in Manitoba to come out and talk openly about the challenges they've faced. We followed a format very similar to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission open hearings that have happened throughout the country where people are invited to step forward and talk openly and publicly about their occurrences and about how they've experienced their, their time in working with the system. What was revealed to us, of course, uh, the tragedies that unfold in the families and the damages that are occurring in the families, but also the lack of services and the gaps in the services that arise when the focus of the, sur of the system is not on the children. The focus is about, I guess, managing the, the money that's there or protecting jobs. What's, what's happened is that a bureaucracy, a culture of bureaucracy has been created that focuses more on its own self-preservation than it does on the protection of children. And I have raised this time and time again in Manitoba. I've, uh, I've actually even had to go to court uh, for, for certain things that, that we have done as Manitoba chiefs to try to uh, infiltrate the system to begin deconstructing the bureaucracy that, that has, uh, I think, contributed to a lot of the damages that our young people are experiencing now. I, as well as other chiefs, have, uh, have, have been very persistent in this and continue to challenge uh, the, the Premier, as well as whatever minister he puts in that chair as the Minister of Child and Family Services. In recent weeks, following the community engagements that we held, I wrote to the, wrote to the Premier, and this was going back to June or July of this year, and I told the Premier there's a very significant connection between our children in care and the numbers of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls in the province of Manitoba. I want to talk to you about this. I want to talk to the other premiers across the country about this with you. And I, I sent that letter, I have documented evidence that I sent that letter to him several weeks before uh, the tragedy involving the young Fontaine girl who was in CFS care at the time of the tragedy. I received a letter today from the premier's office stating that the appropriate forum is not the premier's table, because that's the forum for the national organization, such as the AFN. The appropriate forum would be for me to follow in line with the Manitoba delegation to the National Aboriginal Women's Summit, which is going to be happening in Truro, I believe later this year or next year. So there are processes and systems that are interfering or slowing down this discussion that needs to happen. Ladies and gentlemen, my friends, there's, there's institutional impediments towards moving the markers along and those, uh, we have to find ways of overcoming those challenges. We've got to step beyond them and demonstrate leadership in this time so that our young people have a chance to overcome these things. I, uh, I myself will continue to push at home in Manitoba for these things, but we need a willing partner in, in, at the federal government level. We need a willing partner who's going to step forward and say, you know what, we recognize there is a problem here. 
And I'm not here to get engaged in partisan politics with anybody, but I do know that there are governments out there, there's potential governments out there that are willing to look more seriously at this as opposed to turn a blind eye to it and continue to deny the problem exists. That's not leadership. That's not the kind of leadership Canada needs. <clears throat> I also wanted to talk about, I'm going to move on now to um, education. It's one of the major topics that's come up in the, uh, <clears throat> in the last while is uh, education, First Nations communities. And we have to reflect upon the fact that we're coming out of a residential school legacy. Or I guess I should say the legacy is there, but we're coming out of a residential school era. And it was in the 1970s that our people fought hard and produced the new policy of Indian control over Indian education. And uh, we stand by that because we do believe that when we talk about Indian control of Indian education, in my context, we talk about the treaty right to education as I'm a treaty person. My ancestors signed treaty with the Crown's representatives, which later became the governments which inform the lives of our people today, that we hold a treaty right to education. Now, when I say that there's a treaty right to education, what I'm really saying is that we have a jurisdiction as families and as communities to design and implement the best opportunities we can for our children to learn and to become global citizens. That's what we're talking about when we talk about a treaty right to education. And many people can put many different spins on it. They can say all they want in the media that we're denying access to new money and so forth, but the truth is it's about a jurisdiction a jurisdiction that we won't let go because we need to be involved every step of the way. Because each and every one of our children has a right to identity. They have a right to learn who they are, where they come from, the history of their people, their language, their culture, their ceremonies. Each of our children have that right and we need to preserve it by making sure that we do not allow a prescribed First Nations Education Act devised by who knows who, from who knows where, to be applied to our people in our treaty areas across the nation. We're not going to allow that. There was an enticement that came from Minister Valcour, Minister Valcour is the appointment of Mr. Harper to the portfolio of Indian Affairs. That enticement was packaged up as a, as a $1.2 billion investment in education. And that was perpetuated in the media to sound like it was new money. But while this education announcement and its funding package was being announced, there's still funding cuts happening in education and the existing programs and services across the country. So where were they getting the $1.2 billion from? They're getting it from the programs they're cutting today because they weren't gonna roll out that $1.2 billion until next fiscal year or the fiscal year thereafter. That's how it's being done. And we can see that. We have smart people working in our organizations. We understand policy. We understand fiscal policy. We know Canada's Deficit Reduction Action Plan. We know how they package these things together, collapse program funding into certain pools, and then repackage it to tell Canadians that they're giving First Nations people new money when they're not. They're taking it out of existing pools, creating efficiencies, efficiencies that are creating victims, and saying that this is new money. Well, the gig is up. The gig is up. For Mr. Harper and Mr. Valcour, we're not going to be, uh, I guess, uh, we're not going to believe the, uh, the gimmick anymore. We took a stand against the Education Act, and we had to take a stand even at the, uh, I guess, the consequence being that we had, to, we had to show a division amongst leadership. And that division meant that we had to step aside and, and say that, you know, Mr. Atlio doesn't speak for all of the First Nations across the country, particularly the ones in the treaty areas in the West. We could not accept that bill as it was, regardless of the fact that Mr. Atlio stood with the Conservatives and said that we would. We couldn't. We couldn't do it. So that is why we took the stand we did on education. We believe tr the treaty right to education is something much more than that. You know, it's been said that education in my region, in Manitoba and into Saskatchewan, on the parklands and on the plains, education is the new buffalo. Many people have heard that because historically we were able to rely on buffalo for everything we've, we needed. It was the primary resource for us to live a wealthy life and, and a high quality of living and a standard of living on the plains and in the parklands that we call our homes. I say that 
if the buffalo represents, or if education is our new buffalo, then we need to design a new buffalo hunt. And I'm working on a piece right now. You know, I'm working on something right now because who would I be if I stood up as a national critic to the efforts of our national chief and the efforts of our national organization for education transformation if I didn't come forward with my own solution? Or if I didn't work with people who were able to bring their solutions as well? I can tell you in Manitoba, there's people that have been working for 30 years with the highest levels of education on redesigning and bringing forward options and opportunities for better outcomes and better, better education opportunities for our young people. 30 years we've been doing this already. And we need to empower our people, our professionals, our technical people, our educators in every way towards making sure those opportunities are implemented. But under this new bill, we couldn't do it. So. Moving forward, we need to design the new buffalo hunt. And we need to take a look at what happened with this education bill. And we need to stand back and say, is that the best that, that the government can come forward with? After a funding cap of 2%, which has created probably a seven or eight billion dollar gap in education investment? Because that's what the numbers are really like. When you go back to the implementation of the 2% funding cap, with the growth of our communities and the birth rate in our communities. It's not keeping up with inflation, and that gap is growing every year. And right now, I believe it's to the tune of seven to eight billion dollars of, 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 of lag in investment. That's just in bricks and mortar. That's just in new schools that need to be built. What about curriculum development? What about enhancing our languages again? Because our languages are dying in our communities. Some communities have stepped forward and have developed curriculums that include language immersion, but some can't do it. Some don't have the resources to be able to do that. A lot of our communities don't have the resources to be able to do that, to bring language immersion and culture into their curriculum. The new education bill also set standards that, that mimic the provincial standards for outcomes. But yet when we bring our indigenous pedagogies forward, how do our indigenous ways of knowing fit into the, the, the provincial curriculums? They just don't. There's no fit there right now. So how can we allow a government to prescribe a way of learning or outcomes on the backs of our children? We can't do that right now. We're not saying that we, we want governments to recognize and, and to accept you know, uh, our way entirely. Because we know that to be effective in participating, we do have to integrate. And we do have to engage in, in, in education that's going to make us global players. And many of our people have. Let's not deny the, uh, the quality of the people that we're creating and putting out through the education systems that are there. We have doctors, lawyers, teachers. We have inventors. We have scientists. We have great minds coming through the systems, graduating from the best universities in the country graduating from the best universities in the world and coming home to contribute, even within this system that we're working in. So it's a very, very difficult discussion that we need to have. I believe as well that it's a community-based discussion because each and every one of us have to feel comfortable with sending our children into a school system. You know, a lot of times, the very first time that our children are away from us is when they go to school. And we've, many of us have experienced that, that our, our children will cry for half the day for the first week or month because they're not used to being in that kind of environment. You know, so how do we ensure that in their most vulnerable state that they're getting the best learning, the best opportunity that we can, that we can ensure? Well, we need a discussion about it. We need a discussion at the level of the family, which can be represented at the level of the community. Okay, it doesn't have to be a closed door here in Ottawa or a backroom deal which includes a financial package. It shouldn't be that. It should be inclusive and responsive to what our communities say we want for our children. And it should be regionally focused. We do believe that we can do that. We do believe that as people we can form those aggregates towards, towards uh, outcomes that will reflect what we want for our children's education. We believe that exists already through the various education centers that have been created across the country. They just need the proper empowerment and they need the, we need to get past the messaging that's been perpetuated out there when it comes to education. So, <clears throat> with that said, 
there is opportunity that's been presented from the government with, when it comes to education, and that is by putting the package on the table, we know what it is that they're thinking about. And we have to sit back and say, is this the best that you can come forward with? A $1.2 billion package of funding, tighter controls for the minister over education at the community level, veto power over, the, over who sits on a committee and control over who sits on a committee. That's not about our control, that's about the minister's control. That's about the end of the treaty right to education and, and the sacrifice of the jurisdiction, which is something that we're not gonna do. So we know what we're dealing with now. So now that we know what we're dealing with, we can come back with what we can do. And as I said earlier on about the new buffalo hunt, the reason why I talk about the buffalo hunt is because we knew where the buffalo were gonna be. We were not nomadic people following the buffalo along the plains. We anticipated, we knew, the, we knew where they were gonna be based on the weather patterns, based on the growth patterns. We knew strategically where we needed to camp. And what that allowed us to do was to become predictable. The visionaries on the plains is who we were and who we are allowing us to project our minds into the future to know what we needed to do to get the resources we, we had to have to be successful. That's who we are as, uh, as indigenous people out in the West. And when we think about the redesign of the education system, I think it's safe to conclude that if our children reach the benchmarks of an education system as it moves along, then certainly they will come out of the education system ready and prepared for further learning whether that be in trades, whether that be in post-secondary, or whether that be in college, whether that, there, there's a multitude of opportunity if our children come out of an enhanced or transformed education system that we can start preparing for now. We can be the visionaries we need to be so that the kids that are coming out of the system 15, 20 years from now have the money they need to be able to continue that education because that was a major gap in the First Nations Education Act is that there's no consideration for education beyond grade 12. We know that there's a post-secondary student support program there right now. We know that everybody thinks that, every, that all the First Nations kids get free education, but you know what, we don't. We don't, there's a huge number of children in each community who are turning 18 who don't get access to post-secondary funding because there's not enough there for, to, to send them. Some lists are hundreds of children, children long because they can't get access because there's not enough money that's being funded into that system. So what can we do today? One of the pieces that we're working on in Manitoba right now is making strategic investment in the education of our children as they come in to the world. We know that there are 1,700 children born in Manitoba every year, First Nations children. We are figuring out a way that we can make a seed investment in their future education the moment they arrive. We're working on that system right now. We're working on the, how that would work with, the, uh, with an education savings plan, which they would have so that when they graduate and finish school, they can go into trades training or post-secondary school from there. We have to do that, I think, as parents, as families, and as communities to make sure that our children know we value their future, we value their education, we value the outcomes that they can achieve in their young lives. That's a big piece of what we're doing to complement the Education Act. That's what we're gonna bring forward through Manitoba. So when we look at what the federal government has put on the table, if that's the best they can do, then we have to bring the best we can bring to the discussion. And I don't think we've done that yet. We've been relying too heavily on outcomes that the federal government has brought to us. And those outcomes or those offerings that they've, they've made, they're not good enough. They're not good enough because we've got to do our part too. We can lament the failure of federal governments when it comes to treaty. We can do that all we want. But the truth is we've got to step up too and we've got to provide our solutions to the challenges of making sure our kids get the best outcomes. And that's what the education discussion is all about. But we need a government. We need a government that is going to work with us on that. We need a government that's not going to call me a rogue just because I look at different options we have within our political structure to move agendas and to work with chiefs who are gonna maintain the hard line. I don't wanna be, I wanna be labeled a rogue. I don't, I don't want to be labeled as an outsider just because I'll stand firm for the rights of my family and my children 
and for other indigenous people across the land. I, um, <clears throat> I guess, you know, many people have observed how oftentimes we are characterized or marginalized, uh, you know, through the efforts of propaganda and, and uh, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult to, uh, to be effective, you know, in, in that kind of dynamic where when we step up and say, you know, this isn't a very good option for us, that uh, it's difficult to work with a government that, that does those things. And I wanted to share that with you because, you know, at the end of the day, we, uh, we go home, you know, to our children and uh, to our families and we try to be you know, um, uh, the best people we can be. And we carry agendas and we carry ideas based on our teachings, based on our own understandings. And uh, to be marginalized and to be personally attacked by, by governments and, uh, and, and, and media, media people that, that, that take a conservative or a extreme right-wing conservative uh, agenda forward uh, is, is oftentimes difficult. And some of you may have seen some of the stuff that Sun Media News has, uh, has tried to, uh, to do to me, calling for the boycott of, of Sun Media News recently in Manitoba. And that was uh, the request of, uh, of chiefs in Manitoba that do not want to be identified because they do not want to be vilified the way I have been. But in standing up to be a chief or a grand chief and in the service of our communities, that is what I agree to take on. I agree to take on whatever it is that, uh, that media people or, or the government uh, decide to, to bring my way. That is the sacrifice of leadership. And uh, that's what I'll continue to do. The last bit of, uh, of information that I wanted to share, um, other than education as a national issue, a national discussion, is uh, resource development. And this is all tied in to the, uh, to the broader discussion of education as well, and that is uh, we need to make a transition from uh, fossil fuels and the burning of fossil fuels to alternative and sustainable energy. We uh, <clears throat> recognize that Mr. Harper has a, a national energy plan that includes the development of upwards of $500 billion of, of resources. We recognize that that development plan includes making international agreements with China international agreements with Europe and so forth, which would, I guess in time, if uh, his vision is realized, allow for the transportation of natural resources within the lands of our people to uh, international markets, as well as uh, you know, the, uh, um, the development of the coastlines on the west as well as in the east for refining the resources and the shipment thereof. So. A lot of us have seen the effects of resource development as it is right now, the fracking that's happening, um, the spills, the tailing ponds that are leaking into the waterways and into the river systems. We've seen that. Some of us have been to the tar sands. We've done the healing walk. Some of us have seen and spoken to the, to the families that are suffering from high rates of cancer, living on the edges of these resource development projects. And you know what? We cannot sustain what we're doing to the land. The land cannot sustain us if we continue to do that. Parts of uh, Fort McMurray, where a lot, of these, uh, a lot of this tar sand has been developed, it's lifeless. There's just sand there. There's, uh, it's, like the, it's like walking on the moon, because there's nothing that can grow in those places. And they have little uh, scarecrows from the tailings ponds and cannons to scare the birds to make sure that the birds or nothing goes near those tailing ponds because to touch it is to die. So that's the kind of, uh, the kind of environment that uh, some people would call uh, development or prosperity. And I don't, I don't understand that thinking because I come from a place and an understanding that if we, leave, if we leave the world in a natural state, it's already as perfect as it will be. We cannot make improvements to an already perfect ecosystem that sustains life, no matter who we think we are within our human experience. And we only exist within a thin layer, as well as human beings. You know, from the solidness of the ground to a point in, in, in above us, we can only exist in that space as human beings. So if we poison the water, 
we poison the air, we won't be able to sustain our existence as human beings. And we're already getting a lot of very strong messages from not only the earth, but from the skies. You know, the frequency of, of uh, freak, freak storms. Manitoba's been inundated for years with water, with flooding, with storms that seem to come out of nowhere. And you know what, our, our elders in our territory are anticipating and providing us with teachings as to when to expect these. You know, I, I went to Greg Selinger, the Premier of Manitoba, in February of this year, and I told him the elders are anticipating a major flood this spring, or this summer. And he said, well, our scientists tell us that there's nothing going to be out of the ordinary this year. <laughs> and as you know, if you've been following the news, Manitoba was inundated this year to record levels once again. They had to fully open the portage diversion to dump river water out of the Assiniboine into Lake Manitoba, inundating homes and communities once again. So we have ways of knowing. And I do believe that it's our science, indigenous science, indigenous ways of knowing, mixing with Western science, which is going to create the opportunity to shift from fossil fuels into alternative energy. And we have ways, I believe, of harnessing effectively and for another thousand generations, the energy from earth, wind, water, and fire in a balanced way. So I am now endeavoring to create a national discussion. I will host a national meeting in, in, in Manitoba, hopefully in per, perhaps an international meeting where we can talk about empowering alternative sources of energy. You know, my, my late friend was a very strong proponent of alternative energy and his name was Elijah Harper. Some people may know that he was involved in a lot of different areas, and he talked about you know, the, the, using alternative sources of energy to power vehicles, such as electric cars and so forth. And he was very involved in that, because he knew that you know, time may be running out for us to start shifting away from this fossil fuel discussion to about sustainable energy. It's our responsibility now, and I do believe the time is now to empower the indigenous ways of knowing integrating them together with other powerful ways of knowing, such as Western science, and figuring out ways of moving forward together. And I do believe that uh, we can do it. You know, it's, uh, it's not a matter of, uh, of looking at the situation today, looking at the limitations that are present and how we're harnessing those energies now, but being optimistic that if we put our minds together, we can create these sustainable energies, balancing them out, because one one element is not effective on its own, but to work all four of them together, I believe, could provide that energy for another thousand generations. Earth, wind, water, fire. That's the way of the future. I do believe that we can do it together. So those are the primary issues that I wanted to raise with you. I have, uh, I have said before, you know, in identifying these issues, and I've said to the Manitoba chiefs, and I've said here in Ottawa that I think one of the best things we can do as political organizations is figure out ways of finding a different government to work with in the next, next election. You know, I'm not going to uh, hide that fact. I have... Uh, you when know, describing the Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs earlier on, we were once a, once a very well-funded political organization as long as we played by the rules of the game, they would, they would offer 10, 15 million dollars a year to run our operations. But as soon as I brought in a rights-based approach, rights-based advocacy into the organization, I received a warning from the department that you're going to play ball with us, otherwise things are going to get quiet around here. And I said, I'm bringing a rights-based agenda, and we're, that's, that's the focus that the chiefs have wanted, that's the focus that our communities want. And that's what I've maintained throughout my time as the Grand Chief. And uh, I'll tell you, they cut 85% of our funding within, uh, within about six months after that, uh, that start. And so far this year, the Minister of Indian Affairs has not approved any of the proposals that our organization has put in for project-based funding. Part of our project-based funding is to look at the resource question and to begin developing those discussions and those ideas. They've not funded any of that for our organization. And I do understand that for the longest time they have not been funding the other political organizations across the country either, because they put out what their focus is. 
And if you do not design your proposal around what their focus is, the minister's not going to fund you. And I'm saying the minister because I know those proposals are on his desk. They're on his desk, and he's not going to fund them as long as we're not consistent with what it is that his government wants to push. So we're in a stalemate, my friends. Indigenous people are not willing to yield any further. We're not going to walk into that closed boardroom with the Prime Minister unless our agenda is brought forward. We're not going to allow resource development in our, in our delicate areas without the consent of our communities, and even if there's consent possible, because too much has already been compromised. That's the conditions of the day. But just because we set conditions and just because we take a hard stand, it doesn't mean that we're not friendly. It doesn't mean that we're, we're not the best allies, because we are. As the original people here, we're never going away. We're, never, we're not going to move anywhere else. We're going to stay here. This is where we're always going to be. We want to be strong allies. We want, to, we want to look towards the future for the benefit of our little ones. So with that said, I thank you very much for sitting here listening to me. I, uh, I don't think I went 90 minutes. I don't know if I can speak for 90 minutes without putting everybody to sleep. But I uh, appreciate the time that uh, you've taken today to hear me out. Miigwech. Thank you. If there are any questions, there's a mic up front here, and uh, Grand Chief will respond to them. Bonjour. My name is Helen Bear in the wind. And Chief Nipanak, you, uh, earlier when I come in, you were talking about uh, your, your experience in uh, residential school, and it's, uh, it's commendable that you can uh, talk about that. I, I, I come from that background. My father was in St. Anne's Residential School. He was also in a place called St. Joseph's School for Boys, which I was in. And uh, for the last year and a half, I've been uh, listening to the people from the street. I lived on the street for the last 10 years, five years as a happy drunk, because I, I was introduced to wine and it took my nightmares away. The only other thing that ever took my nightmares away was being introduced to my spiritual way of living which I walked away from because I thought I couldn't forgive my abusers. When in actuality, it was myself I couldn't forgive because of the person I turned into. But I, began, I, I ended up in prison in myself in that victim mentality. And then when I reconnected to those childhood memories before I got taken away and reconnected to the land, lake, and water, and mountain, and the spiritual way of life, I was able to realize it wasn't the priest that I didn't forgive. It was myself. And then I realized my own forgiveness is not here. As long as I continue to walk a good way, my, my, my forgiveness is with Creator. But you mentioned, uh, you mentioned about uh, the difficulties that people have and that they're, and I don't take away, from, take away from our elders and our grandmothers and our grandfathers that have uh, first come out with the residential school system. But there's a, there's a forgotten people, that people, this, uh, this process is forgotten. Like, it's really sad you talked about the bureaucracy when it benefits more than what the victim benefits when you're talking about the, child, the education. And that, well, that same thing has been happening with this residential school process. And that there, long before, like, like when this residential school syndrome first come out, we had our grandmothers and grandfathers out there. And that there, and... Uh, uh, you can never take away from what they, they experienced. I know I've been through that and uh, what they experienced, but uh, a lot of them, they went back to their reserves. And you said that they, 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 were, they were surrounded by their culture. They were surrounded by their things. They didn't, they didn't end up going back out, like, out, out into the street or, or back into that uh, addictive lifestyle. And, that, and these are the people that are forgotten and not there because... When you first come, for, come forward, you had just these little amount of people. So you got these recorders and you went inside the institutions, the mental health wards, the correctional centers, and the federal penitentiaries. And that there, and you got these numbers built up, you got the stories, extracted stories, excruciating stories, you know what? Because I know, 
I was there. And that there, I was fortunate enough to have people in place to help me deal with the issues when I was released. But there's people, there's right now, from this day forward, people that, were ta that give their stories, and seven years later, they come out, the, out of these institutions with the hope, the promise that was made to them when they're, when they're giving their stories, uh, when you get out of these doors, there's going to be there's going to be things in place for you to help deal with you, to help deal with these issues. There's going to be counsel in place. There's going to be places. And when these people get out of these institutions, all these organizations that are set up, this bureaucracy that's extracting the money from this $1.9 billion, they don't know how to deal with these people. So they send them down. And these people, like uh, my cousin in particular, he told me I could share a story. And that there, I'm not going to share his name, but he said, you know what happened to me, Sam, when I come out of this uh, institution? Five years I had hope that when I got out, I'm going to be able to get counseling. There's going to be people there, there in place for me. I got this lady's name for five years, this lady that took, extracted my story from me. When I called her, not to be found, so I go to the organization, the, the one that's supposed to be helping me. And that door is closed in my face because these people don't know how to deal with me. So they send me down to another organization. I go there and the same thing happens. That door gets closed. Down to the next one. That door is closed. Then they get down to another door and they get sent back to the first place they sent. You know what? Those doors were already closed, those people. The frustrations building, that hope that they had when they first got out dwindled away. And that they're... And now the only doors that don't close to them are those liquor stores, the beer stores, the drug stores. And those are the forgotten people, the people that are still struggling in addictions out there that had all those doors shut in their face. There was nothing in place for them when, there was, when, these, when they were being released from the institutions. The, these people got their records. They got their names. They, got, they know when they're going to be released. So why ain't there something in place for them prior to them getting out and say, hey, you know what that promise we made to you five years ago or three years ago or two years ago? We're here to help you. We're here to help you once you're released. There's nothing there. I've seen many of my friends in the last 10 years die needlessly of alcohol and drug-related offenses, homeless people on the street. And that people struggling in addictions, you talk about the marginal people. Those are the ones that are forgotten. And that they're, and what's going to be done for them? That's what I say. I just want to be a voice because I live amongst these people. I hear them. And like I said, this is one of the stories my cousin said. I'll never ever share my story with anybody. He stays in here. A year ago, he was ready to commit a murder just to protect what was inside here. But fortunately, in November, November, he'll be one year sober. Because I told him, you know what? You don't rely on these people. They lie to you. Hey, you know that, so don't rely on them. The only way you're going to get that healing is to go inside yourself and seek that inside and not there. And then once you can deal with that, then maybe you could deal with these organizations that are out there to help you. Like I said, it's very sad when the bureaucracy benefits more than the victims. So miigwech. Uh, it, it just be, because they might have left or they might still be here. Somebody forgot their sandals, their small woman, their children. Find them at uh, Lost uh, Good afternoon. First off, before I speak, I want to acknowledge a woman here for their duties they have in this life for what's happening today in this land across what they call Canada. My name's Edmund Etherington. And I'm sure you know who I am. Spokesperson Nipponak. I heard from one of those spokespersons one time. They told me I don't know what a national chief is. 
I, I was going to ask that person, but out of respect, I kept silent. I asked, what is a grand spokesperson? Today, behind me, these people here today, those are my leaders. Those are the people I cry for when I pray. Those are the people I walk across the land for when I, when I, when I pray and I walk. I do not associate my life around politics. I'll leave that to the educated people on that side of law. I come here in a humble way. Maybe you're not listening to me, but that's okay. I understand, but I come out of respect as a human being, as a human being with no title. I'm a Scott Bills, and that's not a title. That's a responsibility. I come to ask you in front of the mothers here today, the grandmothers, the sisters, the daughters, for those people who suffer for the people across this land to stand up against the system as they call society, calls them warriors. I ask you, and this, I don't know how many times I'm going to offer you tobacco. I'll offer you tobacco in front of this woman again. When that time comes, we're going to call upon those spokespersons to come stand with us. The people who walk across the country, the people who stand up against the system for what are they doing to our, to our land, to our women, for what that earth represents, our mothers, for our responsibilities as sons to protect it. I'm offering you the cinema in front of the people. When that time comes, it's going to come soon to come stand with us for those people especially those grandmothers in northern Quebec today that are standing against the logging company. I asked those people, has those spokespersons come around? And they said no. I question that. It's not, it's not my way to say, to tell you what you guys to do because you always seem to do what it is you want to do. And I said, out of respect, spokesperson Nipponek, out of respect who I am as a human being who has feelings too. But I want to show my emotions today. I want to cry, but I, don't, I choose not to. I want to stand here strong in front of the people. I will offer you this tobacco. I will. I will Make that promise in front of those women for what they represent, the closest to Creator. When that time comes, we call you guys. We ask you to come stand with us as my brother, not as a spokesperson. And I say that in a nice way, a kind way. I do not speak with anger. It's not what that system is going to take away from me. I'm not going to let that system take my spirit away from me. And this is my spirit speaking to you. I, want to, I do want to show my emotions. I want to cry, but I'm not going to. I asked the other spokesperson, Wallace Fox. He played his, he played his politics on me. I have this dream. I have this dream today that when men with pipes sits beside that person who has that Bible, they lift it up together. All religions sit, sit side by side. There's no confusion. Where I can walk with my feet on the ground without being sick. Where I can walk natural, what we were born in. But before society played this confusion, of what's happening today in the state of Canada. I'm not here to speak on interviews and be on pictures. If I was, 
I'm sure. It would change all around, like you said, the media does what it does. But I'm talking as a human being, as Scott Bales, who works for the people, works for creator, works for those women. Because those women create, me and you. And these people behind me, my leaders, those are my leaders. A warrior doesn't stand up because he hates what's in front of him. He stands up because he loves what's behind him. And I say that with all my heart. You have that pull to speak on that media when that time comes to stand with us. You have that pull to do that. I don't, because I choose to stay away from that media. Out of respect as your brother, Masqua. Stand with us when that time comes. It's coming soon. Those warriors out there, those Scott Bales, those women, those grandmothers, going to call upon those spokespersons for what that building represents over there, that government law. I'm speaking from natural law today. And ask them one. I respect you for what it is you're doing. But I need, to, need you to focus on our side of the laws too, as my brother. So I'm offering this tobacco in front of those people as witnesses, in front of those women, in front of the creator, those ancestors that are around here today. I'm asking you, will you come when that time comes? Uh, hello, Mr. Nepanak. My name is Nicole, and I'm going to hold this mic because I'm a little too short. <laughs> um, so anyways, uh, I'm here representing what we call I-Accuse, and it's, in, it's a new um, movement that started called Indigenous and Civil Unified Sovereign Enactment. And the enactment that we are bringing forth is a, um, a contract between the Canadians, for the Canadian citizens to sign together as citizens without the government's involvement to remove final decision-making authority out of all levels of governance. And this would also affect banned councils. Because uh, I've been at Six Nations for quite some time. And the one thing that I've learned, I, I mean, I have so much respect for the traditional ways and the cultures, and we need to bring that back to the Canadian citizens as well, and to spread that and, and the teachings, because a lot of us, I, I was never taught that, and even in the education that the government was offering the nations, I mean, I don't know why you'd even want to accept that, because your, only, your internal teachings are so much more valuable. But the reason I'm here is because we've launched this weekend the IACU's movement and this binding legal contract between every uh, citizen in Canada, the voters, to sign and to remove final decision-making authority, as well as uh, ending political party elections, removing uh, the monarchy in Canada, so that uh, we can create a new two-role living constitution and have a 50-50 governance between uh, the nations and the citizens, which would help bring up 1.2 million of the nations to have an equal voice to 33 million people. And for us, we've been studying this, and this, to us it would be a solution. And when we went, went to Parliament, we had a lot of people who were supporting this. A lot of Canadian people, even the seniors, the French seniors, really would support this. So we're seeing a trend that is totally changing in Canada because given the Idle No More movement and everything that, you, that was started and all of the troubles that have been happening in regards to the Canadian government and what the government is go doing to all the citizens in Canada, including the nations, and what's happening further on a global level because now we're being faced with globalization. We have one, or t one of two choices. We either accept globalization and lose all of our we have no more voice and we will even have less with globalization. 
And you know, it, it's nice to want to be a global citizen, but we really need, really need to, ha to watch what we're saying when we're saying these words. Because a global citizen and interchanging culturally is one thing, but to be a global citizen and being uh, manipulated and being indoctrinated into a system of world governance, by the UN, which is not really helping anybody, we, we really have to sit down and think, how can we stop this from happening and stop the UN and the corporations from coming in? And now what they're trying to do is turn all of the territories, your territories, into fee simple ownership. Fee simple ownership only means that it reverts back to the government upon, upon that title. It, and everybody's going to lose uh, their, their rights to those lands. So we need to stop them in their tracks. So this is why I'm here today. And I'm glad that uh, you and I met on July 17, 2012 at the Royal York when the um, AFN was having their 33rd annual meeting. And I, don't, and I asked you if you knew the Inu chiefs there. So I don't know if you'll recognize me from that time, but I had seen you before on TV and I said, okay, well, I'm going to ask this guy a question. And then I asked you. So... Um, to me, I, I think that uh, I'm hoping that today, because of what's happening now, the nations never are asked their input. The citizens are never asked their input because of the political party system and how it goes. Once we launch this, and I know we're going to succeed because we're not taking no for an answer. We are going to succeed, and once that happens, uh, as being a, a council uh, chief, a band council chief, are you, would you consent to receiving consensus from all of your, the nations in, in your, uh, who are registered with your reserve, all of your people, would you go to them to have consensus at every decision that really needs their input? and not make a move because what we're trying to do here is remove final decision making authority out of all levels of governance which means that when big decisions are made we the government has no choice but to go back to the people for their consent because what happens when you have a political system the political system is the one that removes our voices band council removes the voices the, the way the system is run it removes the voice of the people there too this is what idle no more has been fighting this is what the regular people have been fighting. And I'm hoping that today you will come and join us at the booth over there and make history happen because we, we can do this. Together, the nations and the citizens, we can get this done easily. It's very simple. It just takes a commit. We just need the people. That's all. So that's all I wa want to say and I want to give you this and invite you to come and sit down later on. I'm here all weekend and you can visit our website. Because I think that's a good solution. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Sadie uh, Buju, um, Sadie in Tisakasuan, um, from Bear Clan, Makua. Um, I just wanted to uh, speak a little bit on uh, education. I know that your stance with the uh, government on the First Nations Education Act and the inadequacy of funding, um, I was just curious as to um, what was some of the things that you were working on already? Um, what are some of the things that are already are involved in uh, a new education act? And if there's one there that's, uh, you kind of raise a little bit on uh, regional. So I'm wondering if there's um, a Manitoba, because we're from Manitoba, um, uh, Manitoba Education Act for First Nations. And if um, the funding that was within there that you wanted to propose, if it was something there that, would drop away from the 2% PSSP um, funding so that it would be eligible for all Aboriginal students. Because um, I know that's something there that the students that talk to me that they, they uh, receive inadequate funding from what, that are already sponsored. Um, it's unbalanced within First Nation communities. Um, you know, one community will get over a thousand. Uh, another one will only get maybe 400. Um, is there anything there that will 
that you'd want to propose that would be equalized uh, so we all receive the same benefits, um, but also for all eligible students, for all eligible Aboriginal students. So what was some of the things there that you want to um, propose already that you know? Thank you for the question. I, I think that uh, when we talk about education, um, we bring many different perspectives forward, you know, in terms of how to transform the system and what would be required for transforming the education systems in our communities because we know that the systems uh, that have been funded by government have failed uh, multiple generations of our, uh, of our children on reserve. Um, and since the funding cap was put in place, the, the, uh, the gap accelerates in terms of investment there. So, you know, in, in Manitoba, like I say, we've had, uh, we have the Manitoba First Nations Education Resource Centre that has been uh, alive and well for a long time. They have developed language programs, curriculum, and they have a very uh, vast staff of professionals and technicians that have been working on this issue um, for a number of years now. And, and more recently, engaging directly with the bureaucracy of Indian Affairs on the transformation that's been proposed under the, under the current bill. Okay, so there's been money in play and processes and discussions in play for quite some time. Uh, Gwen Merrick at the Education Resource Center is someone I work very closely with. I get advice from her in terms of what they're doing uh, in their meetings with the, with the federal government. They also participate at the AFN table in this discussion. And um, we've looked at other, other instances where, where education laws have been created. And uh, for me, I'm not sold on the idea that we give away the jurisdiction under a provincial law or under a federal law, but also to consider the, the, the economics of it. It, 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 it. I guess it costs a, a very considerable investment to be able to run a school, to be able to build a school. And uh, governments are at the point now where if they want to put money into education, then they want, they want to put statutory uh, mechanisms in place. That's why the law was drafted. Uh, historically, it's been a, a policy-driven initiative where they can seemingly arbitrarily adjust funding uh, at, a, at, the, at the stroke of a pen from one government to the next without providing guarantees and, and to, uh, without providing guarantees to the rights to education for our young people. So it's, it's been a very, very difficult uh, discussion. And as I said before, you know, the, we do have a, a, a piece that we're working on for uh, trades as well as post-secondary training, something that's going to be more inclusive and open the doors to other opportunities. The solution for, I guess, an equal delivery of the limited resources for post-secondary was proposed uh, a number of years ago, actually on more than one occasion, it was proposed that the post-secondary student support funding go to a, a provincially administered student loans program or a federally administered student loans program, and, and that is not a solution to apply those types of criteria to uh, First Nations students. Uh, Manitoba chiefs uh, did not welcome that idea. In fact, uh, it resulted in Manitoba leadership occupying the, the offices of Indian Affairs and being arrested and going to jail to preserve the, uh, the post-secondary student support funding. So I always, you know, reflect upon that and I see some of the, some of the chiefs that have been there for a long time and I thank them and I respect them for uh, their willingness to go to jail to preserve the opportunity for our people to, uh, to go to school. Because certainly I believe criteria that would be established by, by provincial or federal governments for, for access to education dollars would, would uh, eliminate or, or limit the opportunities for many of our students. So, you know, it's a, it's a, difficult, it's a difficult question, difficult answer. I, I, I believe that the, the exercise of the jurisdiction has to be treaty-based. And a, a treaty-based uh, approach requires recognition of treaty jurisdiction, first and foremost, from the federal government. And it hasn't done that. It hasn't done that. And that's why when we meet with the federal government as treaty people, we want to have the Crown representative there, and that's the Governor General, you know, to, to hopefully create an opportunity for, for politicians of the day to recognize that this relationship goes back uh, far, far beyond, you know, the popular politics of the day. It goes beyond political expediency to a fundamental understanding that we had made that would preserve our jurisdiction. So it's... It's not where it needs to be. We've had legal opinions on a treaty-based negotiation for an education law. I believe that that's a plausible solution, 
but within the construct of the political organizations we work in, such as the AFN and this hierarchical system that they've created, it's hard to get in the, into those discussions. And, and then you lose the messaging as soon as you get caught up in some of the barriers that, are, that exist within the, within the institution of the AFN, such as uh, the Confederacy of Nations, and should the Confederacy be, even be uh, discussed, or whether this is all strictly a Chiefs and Assembly discussion. These are all barriers that prevent uh, the dialogue from moving forward in a good way. So thank you for your question. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh I just want to mention that I appreciated your uh, presentation. I think it was quite informative. Uh, I think that uh, the three issues that you highlighted and not commented upon are, are critically important for sure, but I think it goes beyond that. There are many, and I know your time limit uh, probably you know, prevented you from expand, uh, extending into furthers, but I, I want to contextualize uh, you know, my question around those issues that you had talked about. And I think that the best way I can do it is, uh, uh, you made reference to this whole area of jurisdiction. And if you look at jurisdiction, I want to look at the whole scoop of issues that are affecting First Nations, not only the three that you had mentioned. So, uh, in that context, uh, uh, I, I want to also limit it uh, in the parameters around what you had mentioned in terms of uh, uh, some of the highlights uh, around funding, for example, and finances, and, and you know, your organization uh, in Manitoba was quite funded, uh, quite well funded in the past, and uh, and and I, my question has to do with the funding issue, and uh, really, and if you could extrapolate further on that, because I believe that uh, you know we all consider ourselves as First Nations, and and. And if you're going to be exercising your jurisdiction, then I think you have to be autonomous in that sense, and that goes along uh, everything that encompasses the whole scope of what jurisdiction entails and what autonomy and self-determination uh, pertains. I believe that uh, your whole approach about uh, funding and, and every time that uh, an issue bring, uh, comes up that, uh, the government, uh, that might be contentious to the government's agenda, it's like a sword hanging over your head. They will cut the funding. And, and I want to know if you're advocating that uh, total funding be cut off completely from with the federal government, any ties whatsoever, and that we exert, exert our, uh, and exercise our autonomy as sovereign nations accordingly. Because I think we're gonna continually be in that same predicament you know, and, and it is a definition of insanity. We know that's not going to change. And, and if we, if we keep, keep, keep having that same relationship we have with the federal government now and the status quo has not changed, you know, we're going to be in here for the next, uh, you know, for how long? Long beyond our time, that's for sure. So I'd like you to, to extrapolate further on that whole issue of funding. Miigwech for that uh, very well thought and well considered uh, perspective and question. There is no, um, <clears throat> there's no way to exercise jurisdiction without economic sovereignty. That being uh, looking beyond funding and recognizing that in my territory when treaties were signed we agreed to uh, share the land for agricultural development to the depth of a plow and since then we have seen billions and billions of dollars leave our regions in the form of profits and wealth accruing to a very small number of people and oftentimes even leaving the country, uh, especially in mining. Like a lot of the mining uh, profits don't even stay in, uh, in Canada, let alone Manitoba. You know, so when we talk about the assertion of our sovereignty or the assertion of a jurisdiction, the practical reality is you need the economic sovereignty to back it up. So we can see and point to precise moments in history when governments have impeded or prevented the exercise of economic sovereignty. And I will take, for example, tobacco. The tobacco trade is older than any trade that we know of in the world, okay? The tobacco trade goes back thousands of years, and it was, uh, I would say, within the jurisdiction of indigenous people from here to trade in tobacco uh, as fulsome and as fully as we, we chose to do so for, for millennia. Now we arrive in a day and age when 
uh, many people are able to derive a, a, a quality of life or standard of living within the economics of tobacco. But now we see a new Canadian law that's created to not just regulate the free trade of tobacco, but to criminalize people who are engaged in the tobacco trade. Okay, and those are our, those are our brothers and sisters that, that, that maintain tobacco operations, whether they're growing tobacco or are actively involved in the retail economy of tobacco. That is just one example to, uh, for, for Canadian governments to step in the path of Indigenous trade and commerce, firstly to try and regulate it, and secondly, if regulation doesn't create the, the outcomes that they want, to criminalize First Nations people or Indigenous people for their actions, which is something we've done for thousands of years. And that's what we're facing. The Dakota people in Manitoba had been some of the, ver the most successful agriculturalists in, in, in southern Manitoba. When agriculture was brought forward as, a, as an alternative economy in the early 1900s, the Dakota people became the most successful farmers in the region. Observing the successes of the Dakota people, the, uh, the settlers who had taken up land around the Dakota communities uh, uh, complained to the Indian agent that the Indians were too successful at farming. So they created policies and permit systems denying indigenous people the opportunity to move their product, their agricultural pro produce, off the reserve into the markets that other people were developing. So we've seen over history, you know, the implementation of barriers, economic barriers, economic blockades to the success of indigenous economic sovereignty. And I believe that in the aftermath of all that, we are left with funding. We're left with funding opposed to our own wealth or our own share of the wealth as we reap the benefits of the land. We cannot do that anymore. We're confined. You look at example in the boreal forest, we have many communities that have massive housing shortages. You know, there's people that are, the, uh, homes that are holding 15 people, 20 people in one home, no houses, but we're in the middle of the boreal forest. So why aren't we building houses? Well, because it comes down to a funding issue. It comes down to a funding issue. We cannot generate the wealth from the land to build the homes we need to house our people because it becomes a funding issue. There's not enough funding from CMHC. There's not enough funding in the capital program for each band to keep up with the demand and the growth of our families. And, and we have turned our focus to that. And we have allowed that to win the day now for multiple generations. Instead of going back out onto the land and figuring out ways of, of getting a sawmill in place and figuring out ways of rebuilding our homes with our own local resources, we've allowed people to come in and, and send supplies and construction materials from the south into our northern environments to build for, for, for homes. And that's not a solution either. So there's, it's, it's, a, it's a very uh, big discussion. I don't believe in funding. And uh, once again, going back to what one of my elders told me, um, the, late, the late Elijah Harper, you know, he said, we do not want taxpayer money. We do not want funding from taxpayer money. We want our share of the wealth of resources that, that exists within our ancestral lands. That's what we want. And, you know, and as long as we're continuously denied that, the focus is always going to be on these funding arrangements. And as long as we're always focusing on these funding arrangements, they're going to figure out ways to make us look bad in the media, because that's what they're doing now. They're, they're trying to make us look bad all the time with their funding dollars and the way they control it. So I thank you for your question. Which.